Book the Second, The Golden Thread. Chapter One, Five Years Later. Telson's Bank by Temple Bar was an old-fashioned place, even in the year 1780. It was very small, very dark, very ugly, very incommodious. It was an old-fashioned place, moreover, in the moral attribute that the partners in the house were proud of its smallness, proud of its darkness, proud of its ugliness, proud of its incommodiousness. They were even boastful of its eminence in those particulars, and were fired by an express conviction that, if it were less objectionable, it would be less respectable. This was no passive belief, but an active weapon which they flashed at more convenient places of business. Telson's, they said, wanted no elbow-room, Telson's wanted no light, Telson's wanted no embellishment. Noakes and companies might, or Snooks brothers might, but Telson's, thank heaven! Any one of these partners would have disinherited his son on the question of rebuilding Telson's. In this respect, the house was much on a par with the country, which did very often disinherit its sons for suggesting improvements in laws and customs that had long been highly objectionable, but were only the more respectable. Thus it had come to pass that Telson's was the triumphant perfection of inconvenience. After bursting open a door of idiotic obstinacy, with a weak rattle in its throat, you fell into Telson's down two steps, and came to your senses in a miserable little shop, with two little counters, where the oldest of men made your check shake as if the wind rustled it, while they examined the signature by the dingiest of windows, which were always under a shower-bath of mud from Fleet Street, and which were made the dingier by their own iron bars proper, and the heavy shadow of Temple Bar. If your business necessitated your seeing the house, you were put into a species of condemned hold at the back, where you meditated on a misspent life, until the house came with its hands in its pockets, and you could hardly blink at it in the dismal twilight. Your money came out of, or went into, wormy old wooden drawers, particles of which flew up your nose and down your throat when they were opened and shut. Your banknotes had a musty odour, as if they were fast decomposing into rags again. Your plate was stowed away among the neighbouring cesspools, and evil communications corrupted its good polish in a day or two. Your deeds got into extemporised strong-rooms, made of kitchens and sculleries, and fretted all the fat out of their parchments into the banking-house air. Your lighter boxes of family papers went upstairs into a barmecide room that always had a great dining table in it and never had a dinner, and where, even in the year 1780, the first letters written to you by your old love or by your little children were but newly released from the horror of being ogled through the windows by the heads exposed on Temple Bar with an insensate brutality and ferocity worthy of Abyssinia or Ashanti. But indeed, at that time, putting to death was a recipe much in vogue with all trades and professions, and not least of all with Telson's. Death is nature's remedy for all things, and why not legislations? Accordingly, the forger was put to death, the utterer of a bad note was put to death, the unlawful opener of a letter was put to death the purloiner of forty shillings and sixpence was put to death the holder of a horse at telson's door who made off with it was put to death the coiner of a bad shilling was put to death the sounders of three-fourths of the note in the whole gamut of crime were put to death not that it did the least good in the way of prevention it might almost have been worth remarking that the fact was exactly the reverse but it cleared off as to this world the trouble of each particular case and left nothing else connected with it to be looked after thus 
Telson's, in its day, like greater places of business, its contemporaries, had taken so many lives that, if the heads laid low before it had been ranged on Temple Bar instead of being privately disposed of, they would probably have excluded what little light the ground floor had, in a rather significant manner. Cramped in all kinds of dun cupboards and hutches at Telson's, the oldest of men carried on the business gravely. When they took a young man into Telson's London house, they hid him somewhere till he was old. They kept him in a dark place, like a cheese, until he had the full Telson flavour and blue mould upon him. Then only was he permitted to be seen, spectacularly poring over large books, and casting his breeches and gaiters into the general weight of the establishment. Outside Telson's, never by any means in it, unless called in, was an odd job man, an occasional porter and messenger, who served as the live sign of the house. He was never absent during business hours, unless upon an errand, and then he was represented by his son, a grisly urchin of twelve, who was his express image. People understood that Telson's, in a stately way, tolerated the odd job man. The house had always tolerated some person in that capacity, and time and tide had drifted this person to the post. His surname was Cruncher, and on the youthful occasion of his renouncing by proxy the works of darkness in the easterly parish church of Houndsditch, he had received the added appellation of Jerry. The scene was Mr. Cruncher's private lodging in Hanging Sword Alley, Whitefriars. The time, half-past seven of the clock, on a windy March morning, Anno Domini 1780. Mr. Cruncher himself always spoke of the year of our Lord as Anna Dominoes, apparently under the impression that the Christian era dated from the invention of a popular game by a lady who had bestowed her name upon it. Mr. Cruncher's apartments were not in a savoury neighbourhood, and were but two in number. Even if a closet with a single pane of glass in it might be counted as one. But they were very decently kept. Early as it was, on the windy March morning, the room in which he lay abed was already scrubbed throughout, and between the cups and saucers arranged for breakfast and the lumbering deal table, a very clean white cloth was spread. Mr. Cruncher reposed under a patchwork counterpane, like a harlequin at home. At first he slept heavily, but by degrees began to roll and surge in bed until he rose above the surface with his spiky hair looking as if it must tear the sheets to ribbons. At which juncture he exclaimed in a voice of dire exasperation, "'Bust me if she ain't at it again!' A woman of orderly and industrious appearance rose from her knees in a corner, with sufficient haste and trepidation to show that she was the person referred to. "'What?' said Mr. Cruncher, looking out of bed for a boot. "'You're at it again, are ya?' After hailing the mum with his second salutation, he threw a boot at the woman as a third. It was a very muddy boot, and may introduce the odd circumstance connected with Mr. Cruncher's domestic economy, that, whereas he often came home after banking hours with clean boots, he often got up next morning to find the same boots covered with clay. What, said Mr. Cruncher, varying his apostrophe after missing his mark, what are you up to, Agra waiter? I was only saying my prayers. Saying your prayers? You're a nice woman. What do you mean by flopping yourself down and praying agin me? I was not praying against you. I was praying for you. You weren't. And if you were, I won't be took the liberty with. Here, your mother's a nice woman, young Jerry, going a praying agin your father's prosperity. You've got a dutiful mother, you have, my son. You've got a religious mother, you have, me boy, going and flopping herself down and praying that the bread and butter may be snatched out of the mouth of her only child. 
Master Cruncher, who was in his shirt, took this very ill, and, turning to his mother, strongly deprecated any praying away of his personal board. "'And what do you suppose you conceited female?' said Mr. Cruncher, with unconscious inconsistency, "'that the worth of your prayers may be. Name the price that you put your prayers at.' "'They only come from the heart, Jerry. They are worth no more than that.' "'Worth no more than that,' repeated Mr. Cruncher. "'They ain't worth much, then. Whether or no, I won't be prayed again, I tell you. I can't afford it. I'm not a-going to be made unlucky by your sneaking. If you must go flopping yourself down, flop in favour of your husband and child, and not in opposition to em. If I had any but an unnatural wife, and this poor boy had had any but an unnatural mother, I might have made some money last week, instead of being counter-prayed and counter-mined and religiously circumvented into the worst of luck. Bast me, said Mr. Cruncher, who all this time had been putting on his clothes. "'If I ain't, what with piety and one blowed thing and another, "'been choused this last week into as bad luck "'as ever a poor devil of an honest tradesman met with. "'Young Jerry, dress yourself, my boy, "'and while I clean my boots, keep an eye upon your mother now and then, "'and if you see any signs of more flopping, give me a call. "'For I tell you,' here he addressed his wife once more, I won't be gone again in this manner. I am as rickety as a hackney coach. I am as sleepy as Laudanum. My lines is strained to that degree that I shouldn't know if it wasn't for the pain in them, which was me and which somebody else. Yet I'm none the better for it in pocket, and it's my suspicion that you've been at it from morning to night to prevent me from being the better for it in pocket. I won't put up with it. I get a waiter, and what do you say now? growling in addition such phrases as ah oh, yes you're religious too you wouldn't put yourself in opposition to the interests of your husband and child would you not you and throwing off other sarcastic sparks from the whirling grindstone of his indignation mr cruncher betook himself to his boot cleaning and his general preparation for business in the meantime his son, whose head was garnished with tenderer spikes, and whose young eyes stood close by one another, as his father's did, kept the required watch upon his mother. He greatly disturbed that poor woman at intervals by darting out of his sleeping-closet, where he made his toilet, with a suppressed cry of, "'You're going to flop, mother! Hello, father!' and after raising this fictitious alarm, darting in again with an undutiful grin. Mr. Cruncher's temper was not at all improved when he came to his breakfast. He resented Mrs. Cruncher's saying grace with particular animosity. "'Now, a girl waiter, what are you up to? At it again?' His wife explained that she had merely asked a blessing. "'Don't do it! said Mr. Cruncher, looking about, as if he rather expected to see the loaf disappear under the efficacy of his wife's petitions. "'I ain't a-going to be blessed out of house and home. I won't have my whittles blessed off my table. Keep still!' Exceedingly red-eyed and grim, as if he had been up all night at a party which had taken anything but a convivial turn, Jerry Cruncher worried his breakfast rather than ate it, growling over it like any four-footed inmate of a menagerie. Towards nine o'clock he smoothed his ruffled aspect, and, presenting as respectable and business-like an exterior as he could overlay his natural self with, issued forth to the occupation of the day. It could scarcely be called a trade, in spite of his favourite description of himself as a honest tradesman. His stock consisted of a wooden stall, made out of a broken-backed chair cut down, which stall, young Jerry, walking at his father's side, carried every morning to beneath the banking-house window that was nearest Temple Bar, where, with the addition of the first handful of straw that could be gleaned from any passing vehicle to keep the cold and wet from the odd-job man's feet, it formed the encampment for the day. On this post of his, Mr. Cruncher was as well known to Fleet Street and the Temple as the bar itself. 
and was almost as in-looking. Encamped at a quarter before nine, in good time to touch his three-cornered hat to the oldest of men as they passed into Telson's, Jerry took up his station on this windy March morning, with young Jerry standing by him, when not engaged in making forays through the bar to inflict bodily and mental injuries of an acute description on passing boys who were small enough for his amiable purpose father and son extremely like each other looking silently on at the morning traffic in fleet street with their two heads as near to one another as the two eyes of each were bore a considerable resemblance to a pair of monkeys the resemblance was not lessened by the accidental circumstance that the mature jerry bit and spat out straw while the twinkling eyes of the youthful jerry were as restlessly watchful of him as of everything else in fleet street the head of one of the regular indoor messengers attached to telson's establishment was put through the door and the word was given porter wanted hooray father here's an early job to begin with having thus given his parent godspeed young jerry seated himself on the stool entered on his reversionary interest in the straw his father had been chewing and cogitated always rusty his fingers is always rusty muttered young jerry where does my father get all that iron rust from he don't get no iron rust here end of book two chapter one Chapter 2. A Sight "'You know the old Bailey well, no doubt,' said one of the oldest of clerks to Jerry the messenger. "'Yes, sir,' returned Jerry in something of a dogged manner. "'I do know the Bailey.' "'Just so. And you know Mr. Lorry?' "'I know Mr. Lorry, sir, much better than I know the Bailey, much better,' said Jerry." not unlike a reluctant witness at the establishment in question then i as an honest tradesman wish to know the bailey very well find the door where the witnesses go in and show the doorkeeper this note for mr lorry he will then let you in into the court sir into the court mr cruncher's eyes seemed to get a little closer to one another and to interchange the inquiry what do you think of this a might a wait in the court, sir, he asked as a result of that conference. I'm going to tell you. The doorkeeper will pass the note to Mr. Lorry, and do you make any gesture that will attract Mr. Lorry's attention and show him where you stand? Then what you have to do is to remain there until he wants you. Is that all, sir? That's all. He wishes to have a messenger at hand. This is to tell him you are there. As the ancient clerk deliberately folded and superscribed the note, Mr. Cruncher, after surveying him in silence until he came to the blotting-paper stage, remarked, "'I suppose they'll be trying forgeries this morning.' "'Treason!' "'That's quartering,' said Jerry. "'Barbarous!' "'It is the law,' remarked the ancient clerk, turning his surprised spectacles upon him. "'It is the law.' It's hard in the law to spile a man, I think. It's hard enough to kill him, but it's very hard to spile him, sir. Not at all, retained the ancient clerk. Speak well of the law. Take care of your chest and voice, my good friend, and leave the law to take care of itself. I give you that advice. It's the damp, sir, what settles on my chest and voice, said Jerry. I leave you to judge what a damp way of earning a living mine is. "'Well, well,' said the old clerk, "'we all have our various ways of gaining a livelihood. "'Some of us have damp ways, and some of us have dry ways. "'Here is the letter. Go along.' "'Jerry took the letter, and remarking to himself "'with less internal deference than he made an outward show of, "'You're a lean old one, too,' made his bow, "'informed his son, in passing, of his destination, and went his way.' They hanged at Tyburn in those days, so the street outside Newgate had not obtained one infamous notoriety that has since attached to it.
But the jail was a vile place in which most kinds of debauchery and villainy were practised, and where dire diseases were bred that came into court with the prisoners, and sometimes rushed straight from the dock at my Lord Chief Justice himself, and pulled him off the bench. It had more than once happened that the judge in the black cap pronounced his own doom as certainly as the prisoners had even died before him. For the rest, the old bailey was famous as a kind of deadly inn-yard, from which pale travellers set out continually, in carts and coaches, on a violent passage into the other world, traversing some two miles and a half of public streets and road, and shaming few good citizens, if any. So powerful is use, and so desirable to be good use in the beginning. It was famous, too, for the pillory, a wise old institution that inflicted a punishment of which no one could foresee the extent. Also for the whipping-post, another dear old institution, very humanizing and softening to behold in action. Also for extensive transactions in blood-money, another fragment of ancestral wisdom, systematically leading to the most frightful mercenary crimes that could be committed under heaven. Altogether, the old Bailey, at that date, was a choice illustration of the precept that whatever is, is right, an aphorism that would be as final as it is lazy, did it not include the troublesome consequence that nothing that ever was, was wrong. Making his way through the tainted crowd, dispersed up and down this hideous scene of action, with the skill of a man accustomed to make his way quietly, the messenger found out the door he sought, and handed in his letter through a trap in it. For, people were then paid to see the play at the Old Bailey, just as they paid to see the play in Bedlam, only the former entertainment was much the dearer. Therefore, all the Old Bailey doors were well guarded, except, indeed, the social doors by which the criminals got there, and those were always left wide open. After some delay and demur, the door grudgingly turned on its hinges a very little way and allowed Mr. Jerry Cruncher to squeeze himself into court. "'What's on?' he asked in a whisper of the man he found himself next to. "'Nothing yet. What's coming on? The treason case, the quartering one, eh?' ah returned the man with a relish he'll be drawn on a hurdle to be half hanged and then he'll be taken down and sliced before his own face and then his inside will be taken out and burnt while he looks on and then his head will be chopped off and he'll be cut into quarters that's the sentence if he's found guilty you mean to say jerry added by way of proviso oh they'll find him guilty said the other don't you be afraid of that Mr. Cruncher's attention was here diverted to the doorkeeper, whom he saw making his way to Mr. Lorry, with the note in his hand. Mr. Lorry sat at a table among the gentlemen in wigs, not far from a wigged gentleman, the prisoner's counsel, who had a great bundle of papers before him, and nearly opposite another wigged gentleman with his hands in his pockets, whose whole attention, when Mr. Cruncher looked at him then or afterwards, seemed to be concentrated on the ceiling of the court after some gruff coughing and rubbing of his chin and signing with his hand jerry attracted the notice of mr lorry who had stood up to look for him and who quietly nodded and sat down again what's he got to do with the case asked the man he had spoken with blessed if i know said jerry what have you got to do with it then if a person may inquire blessed if i know that either said jerry the entrance of the judge and a consequent great stir and settling down in the court stopped the dialogue presently the dock became the central point of interest two jailers who had been standing there went out and the prisoner was brought in and put to the bar 
Everybody present except the one-wigged gentleman who looked at the ceiling stared at him. All the human breath in the place rolled at him like a sea or a wind or a fire. Eager faces strained round pillars and corners to get a sight of him. Spectators in back rows stood up not to miss a hair of him. People on the floor of the court laid their hands on the shoulders of the people before them to help themselves at anybody's cost to a view of of him, stood a tiptoe, got upon ledges, stood upon next to nothing to see every inch of him. Conspicuous among these latter, like an animated bit of the spiked wall of Newgate, Jerry stood, aiming at the prisoner the beery breath of what he had taken as he came along, and discharging it to mingle with the waves of other beer and gin and tea and coffee and what not that flowed at him, and already broke upon the great windows behind him in an impure mist and rain. The object of all this staring and blaring was a young man of about five-and-twenty, well-grown and well-looking, and well with a sunburnt cheek and a dark eye. His condition was that of a young gentleman. He was plainly dressed in black, or very dark grey, and his hair, which was long and dark, was gathered in a ribbon at the back of his neck, more to be out of his way than for ornament. As an emotion of the mind will express itself through any covering of the body, so the paleness which his situation engendered came through the brown upon his cheek, showing the soul to be stronger than the sun. He was otherwise quite self-possessed, bowed to the judge, and stood quiet. The sort of interest with which this man was stared and breathed at was not a sort that elevated humanity. Had he stood in peril of a less horrible sentence, had there been a chance of any one of its savage details being spared, by just so much would he have lost in his fascination. The form that was to be doomed to be so shamefully mangled was the sight. The immortal creature that was to be so butchered and torn asunder yielded the sensation. Whatever gloss the various spectators put upon the interest, according to their several arts and powers of self-deceit, the interest was, at the root of it, ogreish. Silence in the court! Charles Darnay had yesterday pleaded not guilty to an indictment denouncing him, with infinite jingle and jangle, for that he was a false traitor to our serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth, prince, our lord the king, by reason of his having, on diverse occasions, and by diverse means and ways, assisted Louis, the French king, in his wars against our said serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth, that was to say, by coming and going between the dominions of our said serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth, and those of the said French Lewis, and wickedly, falsely, traitorously, and otherwise evil adverbiously, revealing to the said French Lewis what forces our said serene, illustrious, excellent, and so forth, had in preparation to send to Canada and North America. This much Jerry, with his head becoming more and more spiky, as the law terms bristled it, made out with huge satisfaction, and so arrived circuitously at the understanding that the aforesaid, and over and over again aforesaid, Charles Darnay, stood there before him upon his trial, that the jury was swearing in, and that Mr. Attorney General was making ready to speak. The accused, who was, and who knew he was, being mentally hanged, beheaded, and quartered by everybody there, neither flinched from the situation, nor assumed any theatrical air in it. He was quiet and attentive, watched the opening proceedings with a grave interest, and stood with his hands resting on a slab of wood before him, so composedly that they had not displaced a leaf of the herbs with which it was strewn. The court was all bestrewn with herbs and sprinkled with vinegar as a precaution against jail air and jail fever. Over the prisoner's head there was a mirror to throw the light down upon him. Crowds of the wicked and the wretched had been reflected in it, and had passed from its surface and this earth's together. 
haunted in a most ghastly manner that abominable place would have been if the glass could ever have rendered back its reflections as the ocean is one day to give up its dead some passing thought of the infamy and disgrace for which it had been reserved may have struck the prisoner's mind be that as it may a change in his position making him conscious of a bar of light across his face he looked up and when he saw the glass his face flushed and his right hand pushed the herbs away it happened that the action turned his face to that side of the court which was on his left about on a level with his eyes there sat in that corner of the judge's bench two persons upon whom his look immediately rested so immediately and so much to the changing of his aspect that all the eyes that were turned upon him turned to them the spectators saw in the two figures a young lady of little more than twenty and a gentleman who was evidently her father a man of a very remarkable appearance in respect of the absolute whiteness of his hair and a certain indescribable intensity of face not of an active kind but pondering and self-communing when this expression was upon him he looked as if he were old but when it was stirred and broken up as it was now in a moment on his speaking to his daughter he became a handsome man not past the prime of life his daughter had one of her hands drawn through his arm as she sat by him and the other pressed upon it she had drawn close to him in her dread of the scene and in her pity for the prisoner her forehead had been strikingly expressive of an engrossing terror and compassion that saw nothing but the peril of the accused this had been so very noticeable so very powerfully and naturally shown that starers who had had no pity for him were touched by her and the whisper went about who are they jerry the messenger who had made his own observations in his own manner and who had been sucking the rust off his fingers in his absorption stretched his neck to hear who they were the crowd about him had pressed and passed the inquiry on to the nearest attendant and from him it had been more slowly pressed and passed back at last it got to jerry witnesses for which side against against what side the prisoners the judge whose eyes had gone in the general direction recalled them leaned back in his seat and looked steadily at a man whose life was in his hand as mr attorney-general rose to spin the rope grind the axe and hammer the nails into the scaffold end of book two chapter two Chapter 3. A Disappointment Mr. Attorney-General had to inform the jury that the prisoner before them, though young in years, was old in the treasonable practices which claimed the forfeit of his life, that this correspondence with the public enemy was not a correspondence of today, or of yesterday, or even of last year, or of the year before, that it was certain the prisoner had for longer than that been in the habit of passing and repassing between France and England on secret business of which he could give no honest account that if it were in the nature of traitorous ways to thrive which happily it never was the real wickedness and guilt of his business might have remained undiscovered that providence however had put it into the heart of a person who was beyond fear and beyond reproach to ferret out the nature of the prisoner's schemes and struck with horror to disclose them to his majesty's chief secretary of state and most honourable privy council that this patriot would be produced before them that his position and attitude were on the whole sublime that he had been the prisoner's friend but at once in an auspicious and an evil hour detecting his infamy had resolved to immolate the traitor he could no longer cherish in his bosom on the sacred altar of his country that if statues were decreed in britain as in ancient greece and rome to public benefactors the shining citizen would assuredly have had one that as they were not so decreed he probably would not have one 
that virtue as has been observed by the poets in many passages which he well knew the jury would have word for word at the tips of their tongues whereat the jury's countenances displayed a guilty consciousness that they knew nothing about the passages was in a manner contagious more especially the bright virtue known as patriotism or love of country that the lofty example of this immaculate and unimpeachable witness for the crown to refer to whom however unworthily was an honour had communicated itself to the prisoner's servant and had engendered in him a holy determination to examine his master's table drawers and pockets and secrete his papers that he mr attorney-general was prepared to hear some disparagement attempted of this admirable servant but that in a general way he preferred him to his mr attorney-general's brothers and sisters and honoured him more than his mr attorney-general's father and mother that he called with confidence on the jury to come and do likewise that the evidence of these two witnesses coupled with the documents of their discovering that would be produced would show the prisoner to have been furnished with lists of his majesty's forces and of their disposition and preparation both by sea and land and would leave no doubt that he had habitually conveyed such information to a hostile power that these lists could not be proved to be in the prisoner's handwriting but that it was all the same that indeed it was rather the better for the prosecution as showing the prisoner to be artful in his precautions that the proof would go back five years and would show the prisoner already engaged in these pernicious missions within a few weeks before the date of the very first action fought between the british troops and the americans that for these reasons the jury being a loyal jury as he knew they were and being a responsible jury as they knew they were must positively find the prisoner guilty and make an end of him whether they liked it or not that they never could lay their heads upon their pillows that they never could tolerate the idea of their wives laying their heads upon their pillows that they never could endure the notion of their children laying their heads upon their pillows in short that there never more could be for them or theirs any laying of heads upon pillows at all unless the prisoner's head was taken off that head mr attorney-general concluded by demanding of them in the name of everything he could think of with a round turn in it and on the faith of his solemn asseveration that he already considered the prisoner as good as dead and gone when the attorney-general ceased a buzz arose in the court as if a cloud of great blue flies were swarming about the prisoner in anticipation of what he was soon to become when toned down again the unimpeachable patriot appeared in the witness-box mr solicitor-general then following his leader's lead examined the patriot john barsad gentleman by name the story of his pure soul was exactly what mr attorney-general had described it to be perhaps if it had a fault a little too exactly having released his noble bosom of its burden he would have modestly withdrawn himself but that the wicked gentleman with the papers before him sitting not far from mr lorry begged to ask him a few questions the wicked gentleman sitting opposite still looking at the ceiling of the court had he ever been a spy himself no he scorned the base insinuation what did he live upon his property where was his property he didn't precisely remember where it was what was it no business of anybody's had he inherited it yes he had from whom distant relation very distant rather ever been in prison certainly not never in a debtor's prison didn't see what that had to do with it never in a debtor's prison come once again never yes how many times two or three times not five or six perhaps of what profession gentlemen ever been kicked might have been frequently no ever kicked downstairs decidedly not once received a kick on the top of the staircase and fell downstairs of his own accord 
kicked on that occasion for cheating at dice? And something to that effect was said by the intoxicated liar who committed the assault, but it was not true. Swear it was not true? Positively. Ever lived by cheating at play? Never. Ever lived by play? Not more than other gentlemen do. Ever borrow money of the prisoner? Yes. Ever pay him? No. Was not this intimacy with the prisoner in reality a very slight one, forced upon the prisoner in coaches, inns, and packets? No. Sure he saw the prisoner with these lists? Certain. Knew no more about the lists? No. Had not procured them himself, for instance? No. Expect to get anything by this evidence? No. Not in regular government pay and employment to lay traps? Oh, dear, no. Or to do anything? Oh, dear, no. Swear that over and over again. No motives but motives of sheer patriotism? None whatsoever. The virtuous servant, Roger Cly, swore his way through the case at a great rate. He had taken service with the prisoner, in good faith and simplicity, four years ago. He had asked the prisoner, aboard the Calais packet, if he wanted a handy fellow, and the prisoner had engaged him. He had not asked the prisoner to take the handy fellow as an act of charity, never thought of such a thing. He began to have suspicions of the prisoner, and to keep an eye upon him soon afterwards in arranging his clothes. While travelling, he had seen similar lists to these in the prisoner's pockets over and over again. He had taken these lists from the drawer of the prisoner's desk. He had not put them there first. He had seen the prisoner show these identical lists to French gentlemen at Calais, and similar lists to French gentlemen both at Calais and Boulogne. He loved his country, and couldn't bear it, and had given information. He had never been suspected of stealing a silver teapot. He had been maligned respecting a mustard pot, but it turned out to be only a plated one. He had known the last witness seven or eight years. That was merely a coincidence. He didn't call it a particularly curious coincidence. Most coincidences were curious. Neither did he call it a curious coincidence that true patriotism was his only motive, too. He was a true Briton, and hoped there were many like him. The blue flies buzzed again, and Mr. Attorney General called Mr. Jarvis Lorry. Mr. Jarvis Lorry, are you a clerk in Telson's bank? I am. On a certain Friday night in November 1775, did business occasion you to travel between London and Dover by the mail? It did. Were there any other passengers in the mail? Two. Did they alight on the road in the course of the night? They did. Mr. Lorry, look upon the prisoner. Was he one of those two passengers? I cannot undertake to say that he was. Does he resemble either of these two passengers? Both were so wrapped up, and the night was so dark, and we were all so reserved, that I cannot undertake to say even that. Mr. Lorry, look again upon the prisoner. Supposing him wrapped up as those two passengers were, is there anything in his bulk and stature to render it unlikely that he was one of them? No. You will not swear, Mr. Lorry, that he was not one of them? No. So at least you say he may have been one of them. Yes, except that I remember them both to have been, like myself, timorous of highwaymen, and the prisoner has not a timorous air. Did you ever see a counterfeit of timidity, Mr. Lorry? I certainly have seen that. Mr. Lorry, look once more upon the prisoner. Have you seen him to your certain knowledge before? I have. When? I was returning from France a few days afterwards, and at Calais the prisoner came on board the packet-ship in which I returned and made the voyage with me. At what hour did he come on board? At a little after midnight. In the dead of the night. Was he the only passenger who came on board at that untimely hour? He happened to be the only one. Never mind about happening, Mr. Lorry. He was the only passenger who came on board in the dead of the night? He was. Were you travelling alone, Mr. Lorry, or with any companion? With two companions, a gentleman and a lady. They are here. They are here. Have you had any conversation with the prisoner? 
Hardly any. The weather was stormy and the passage long and rough, and I lay on a sofa almost from shore to shore. Miss Manette! The young lady, to whom all eyes had been turned before, and were now turned again, stood up where she had sat. Her father rose with her, and kept her hand drawn through his arm. "'Miss Manette, look upon the prisoner!' To be confronted with such pity and such earnest youth and beauty was far more trying to the accused than to be confronted with all the crowd, standing as it were apart with her on the edge of his grave. Not all the staring curiosity that looked on could, for the moment, nerve him to remain quite still. His hurried right hand parcelled out the herbs before him into imaginary beds of flowers in a garden, and his efforts to control and steady his breathing shook the lips from which the colour rushed to his heart. The buzz of the great flies was loud again. "'Miss Manette, have you seen the prisoner before?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Where?' "'On board the packet-ship just now referred to, sir, and on the same occasion.' "'You are the young lady just now referred to?' "'Oh, most unhappily I am.' The plaintive tone of her compassion merged into the less musical voice of the judge, as he said something fiercely. "'Answer the questions put to you, and make no remark upon them.' "'Miss Manette, had you any conversation with the prisoner on that passage across the channel?' "'Yes, sir. Recall it.' In the midst of a profound stillness, she faintly began— when the gentleman came on board, do you mean the prisoner? inquired the judge, knitting his brows. Yes, my lord. Then say the prisoner. When the prisoner came on board, he noticed that my father, turning her eyes lovingly to him as he stood beside her, was much fatigued and in a very weak state of health. My father was so reduced that I was afraid to take him out of the air, and I had made a bed for him on the deck near the cabin steps, and I sat on the deck at his side to take care of him. There were no other passengers that night, but we four. The prisoner was so good as to beg permission to advise me how I could shelter my father from the wind and weather better than I had done. I had not known how to do it well, not understanding how the wind would set when we were out of the harbour. He did it for me. He expressed great gentleness and kindness for my father's state, and I am sure he felt it. That was the manner of our beginning to speak together. Let me interrupt you for a moment. Had he come on board alone? No. How many were with him? Two French gentlemen. Had they conferred together? They had conferred together until the last moment, when it was necessary for the French gentlemen to be landed in their boat. Had any papers been handed about among them, similar to these lists? Some papers had been handed about among them, but I don't know what papers. Like these in shape and size? Possibly, but indeed I don't know, although they stood whispering very near to me, because they stood at the top of the cabin steps to have the light of the lamp that was having there. It was a dull lamp, and they spoke very low, and I did not hear what they said, and saw only that they looked at papers. Now, to the prisoner's conversation, Miss Manette. The prisoner was as open in his confidence with me, which arose out of my helpless situation, as he was kind and good and useful to my father. I hope, bursting into tears, I may not repay him by doing him harm to-day. Buzzing from the blue flies. Miss Manette, if the prisoner does not perfectly understand that you give the evidence which is your duty to give, which you must give, and which you cannot escape from giving, with great unwillingness, he is the only person present in that condition. Please to go on. He told me that he was travelling on business of a delicate and difficult nature, which might get people into trouble, and that he was therefore travelling under an assumed name. He said that this business had, within a few days, taken him to France, and might, at intervals, take him backwards and forwards between France and England for a long time to come. Did he say anything about America, Miss Manette? Be particular. 
he tried to explain to me how that quarrel had arisen and he said that so far as he could judge it was a wrong and foolish one on england's part he added in a jesting way that perhaps george washington might gain almost as great a name in history as george the third but there was no harm in his way of saying this it was said laughingly and to beguile the time any strongly marked expression of face on the part of a chief actor in a scene of great interest to whom many eyes are directed will be unconsciously imitated by the spectators her forehead was painfully anxious and intent as she gave this evidence and in the pauses when she stopped for the judge to write it down watched its effect upon the counsel for and against among the lookers-on there was the same expression in all quarters of the court insomuch that a great majority of the foreheads there might have been mirrors reflecting the witness when the judge looked up from his notes to glare at that tremendous heresy about george washington mr attorney-general now signalled to my lord that he deemed it necessary as a matter of precaution and form to call the young lady's father dr manette who was called accordingly dr manette look upon the prisoner have you ever seen him before once when he called at my lodgings in london some three years or three years and a half ago can you identify him as your fellow passenger on board the packet or speak to his conversation with your daughter sir i can do neither is there any particular and special reason for your being unable to do either he answered in a low voice there is has it been your misfortune to undergo a long imprisonment without trial or even accusation in your native country dr manette he answered in a tone that went to every heart, A long imprisonment. Were you newly released on the occasion in question? They tell me so. Have you no remembrance of the occasion? None. My mind is a blank from some time, I cannot even say what time, when I employed myself in my captivity in making shoes, to the time when I found myself living in London with my dear daughter here. She had become familiar to me when a gracious God restored my faculties. But I am quite unable even to say how she has become familiar. I have no remembrance of the process. Mr. Attorney-General sat down, and the father and daughter sat down together. A singular circumstance then arose in the case, the object in hand being to show that the prisoner went down with some fellow plotter untracked in the Dover mail on that Friday night in November five years ago, and got out of the mail in the night, as a blind, at a place where he did not remain, but from which he travelled back some dozen miles or more to a garrison and dockyard, and there collected information a witness was called to identify him as having been at the precise time required in the coffee-room of an hotel in that garrison and dockyard town waiting for another person the prisoner's counsel was cross-examining this witness with no result except that he had never seen the prisoner on any other occasion when the wicked gentleman who had all this time been looking at the ceiling of the court wrote a word or two on a little piece of paper screwed it up and tossed it to him opening this piece of paper in the next pause the counsel looked with great attention and curiosity at the prisoner you say again you are quite sure that it was the prisoner the witness was quite sure did you ever see anybody very like the prisoner not so like the witness said as that he could be mistaken look well upon that gentleman my learned friend there pointing to him who had tossed the paper over and then look well upon the prisoner how say you are they very like each other allowing for my learned friend's appearance being careless and slovenly if not debauched they were sufficiently like each other to surprise not only the witness but everybody present when they were thus brought into comparison my lord being prayed to bid my learned friend lay aside his wig and giving no very gracious consent the likeness became much more remarkable my lord inquired of mr striver the prisoner's counsel whether they were next to try mr carton name of my learned friend for treason 
but Mr. Stryver replied to my lord, no, but he would ask the witness to tell him whether what happened once might happen twice, whether he would have been so confident if he had seen this illustration of his rashness sooner, whether he would be so confident having seen it and more. The upshot of which was to smash this witness like a crockery vessel and shiver his part of the case to useless lumber. Mr. Cruncher had by this time taken quite a lunch of rust off his fingers in his following of the evidence. He had now to attend, while Mr. Stryver fitted the prisoner's case on the jury, like a compact suit of clothes, showing them how the patriot, Barsad, was a hired spy and traitor, an unblushing trafficker in blood, and one of the greatest scoundrels upon earth since accursed Judas, which he certainly did look rather like how the virtuous servant cly was his friend and partner and was worthy to be how the watchful eyes of those forgers and false swearers had rested on the prisoner as a victim because some family affairs in france he being of french extraction did require his making those passages across the channel though what those affairs were a consideration for others who were near and dear to him forbade him even for his life to disclose how the evidence that had been warped and wrested from the young lady whose anguish in giving it they had witnessed came to nothing involving the mere little innocent gallantries and politenesses likely to pass between any young gentleman and young lady so thrown together with the exception of that reference to george washington which was altogether too extravagant and impossible to be regarded in any other light than as a monstrous joke how it would be a weakness in the government to break down in this attempt to practice for popularity on the lowest national antipathies and fears, and therefore Mr. Attorney-General had made the most of it. How, nevertheless, it rested upon nothing save that vile and infamous character of evidence too often disfiguring such cases, and of which the state trials of this country were full. But, there my lord interposed, with as grave a face as if it had not been true, saying that he could not sit upon that bench and suffer those allusions. Mr. Stryver then called his few witnesses, and Mr. Cruncher had next to attend, while Mr. Attorney-General turned the whole suit of clothes Mr. Stryver had fitted on the jury inside out, showing how Barsard and Cly were even a hundred times better than he had thought them, and the prisoner a hundred times worse. Lastly came my lord himself, turning the suit of clothes, now inside out, now outside in, but on the whole decidedly trimming and shaping them into grave clothes for the prisoner. And now the jury turned to consider, and the great flies swarmed again. Mr. Carton, who had so long sat looking at the ceiling of the court, changed neither his place nor his attitude, even in this excitement while his teamed friend mr stryver massing his papers before him whispered with those who sat near and from time to time glanced anxiously at the jury while all the spectators moved more or less and grouped themselves anew while even my lord himself rose from his seat and slowly paced up and down his platform, not unattended by a suspicion in the minds of the audience that his state was feverish, this one man sat leaning back, with his torn gown half off him, his untidy wig put on just as it had happened to fight on his head after its removal, his hands in his pockets, and his eyes on the ceiling as they had been all day. Something especially reckless in his demeanour not only gave him a disreputable look, but so diminished the strong resemblance he undoubtedly bore to the prisoner, which his momentary earnestness, when they were compared together, had strengthened. That many of the lookers-on, taking note of him now, said to one another they would hardly have thought the two were so alike. Mr. Cruncher made the observation to his next neighbour, and added, "'I'd hold half a guinea that he don't get no law work to do. Don't look like the sort of one to get any, do he?' 
Yet, this Mr. Carton took in more of the details of the scene than he appeared to take in, for now, when Miss Manette's head drooped upon her father's breast, he was the first to see it, and to say audibly, "'Officer, look to that young lady. Help the gentleman to take her out. Don't you see she will fall?' There was much commiseration for her as she was removed, and much sympathy with her father. It had evidently been a great distress to him to have the days of his imprisonment recalled. He had shown strong internal agitation when he was questioned, and that pondering or brooding look which made him old had been upon him like a heavy cloud ever since. As he passed out, the jury, who had turned back and paused a moment, spoke through their foreman. They were not agreed, and wished to retire. My lord, perhaps with George Washington on his mind, showed some surprise that they were not agreed, but signified his pleasure that they should retire under watch and ward, and retired himself. The trial had lasted all day, and the lamps in the court were now being lighted. It began to be rumoured that the jury would be out a long while. The spectators dropped off to get refreshment, and the prisoner withdrew to the back of the dock and sat down. Mr. Lorry, who had gone out when the young lady and her father went out, now reappeared and beckoned to Jerry, who, in the slackened interest, could easily get near him. "'Jerry, if you wish to take something to eat, you can, but keep in the way. You will be sure to hear when the jury come in. Don't be a moment behind them, for I want you to take the verdict back to the bank. You are the quickest messenger I know, and will get to Temple Bar long before I can.' Jerry had just enough forehead to knuckle, and he knuckled it in acknowledgment of this communication, and a shilling. Mr. Carton came up at the moment and touched Mr. Lorry on the arm. "'How is the young lady?' "'She is greatly distressed, but her father is comforting her, "'and she feels the better for being out of court. "'I'll tell the prisoner so. "'It won't do for a respectable bank gentleman like you "'to be seen speaking to him publicly, you know.' "'Mr. Lorry reddened, as if he were conscious "'of having debated the point in his mind, "'and Mr. Carton made his way to the outside of the bar. "'The way out of court lay in that direction, "'and Jerry followed him, all eyes, ears, and spikes. "'Mr. Darnay,' the prisoner came forth directly, "'you will naturally be anxious to hear of the witness, Miss Manette. "'She will do very well. "'You have seen the worst of her agitation. "'I am deeply sorry to have been the cause of it. "'Could you tell her so for me with my fervent acknowledgments? "'Yes, I could. I will if you ask it.' Mr. Carton's manner was so careless as to be almost insolent. He stood, half-turned from the prisoner, lounging with his elbow against the bar. "'I do ask it. Accept my cordial thanks.' "'What?' said Carton, still only half-turned towards him. "'Do you expect, Mr. Darnay?' "'The worst. It's the wisest thing to expect and the likeliest, but I think their withdrawing is in your favour. Loitering on the way out of court not being allowed, Jerry heard no more, but left them, so like each other in feature, so unlike each other in manner, standing side by side, both reflected in the glass above them. An hour and a half limped heavily away in the thief and rascal crowded passages below, even though assisted off with mutton pies and ale. The horse messenger, uncomfortably seated on a form after taking that refection, had dropped into a doze, when a loud murmur and a rapid tide of people setting up the stairs that led to the court carried him along with them. "'Jerry! Jerry!' Mr. Lorry was already calling at the door when he got there. "'Here, yes, sir, it's a fight to get back again. Here I am, sir!' Mr. Lorry handed him a paper through the throng. "'Quick, have you got it?' "'Yes, sir!' Hastily written on the paper was the word acquitted. "'If you had sent the message recalled to life again,' muttered Jerry as he turned, "'I should have known what you meant this time.' He had no opportunity of saying or so much as thinking anything else until he was clear of the old bailey, for the crowd came pouring out with a vehemence that nearly took him off his legs, and a loud buzz swept into the street as if the baffled blue flies were dispersing in search of other carrion. End of Book 1, Chapter 3 
Chapter 4. Congratulatory. From the dimly lighted passages of the court, the last sediment of the human stew that had been boiling there all day was straining off, when Dr. Manette, Lucy Manette, his daughter, Mr. Lorry, the solicitor for the defence, and its counsel, Mr. Striver, stood gathered round Mr. Charles Darnay, just released, congratulating him on his escape from death. It would have been difficult by a far brighter light to recognize in Dr. Manette, intellectual of face and upright of bearing, the shoemaker of the garret in Paris. Yet, no one could have looked at him twice without looking again, even though the opportunity of observation had not extended to the mournful cadence of his low, grave voice, and to the abstraction that clouded him fitfully without any apparent reason. While one external cause, and that a reference to his long lingering agony, would always, as on the trial, evoke this condition from the depths of his soul, it was also in its nature to arise of itself, and to draw a gloom over him, as incomprehensible to those unacquainted with his story, as if they had seen the shadow of the actual Bastille thrown upon him by a summer sun, when the substance was three hundred miles away. Only his daughter had the power of charming this black brooding from his mind. She was the golden thread that united him to a past beyond his misery, and to a present beyond his misery. And the sound of her voice, the light of her face, the touch of her hand, had a strong beneficial influence with him almost always. Not absolutely always, for she could recall some occasions on which her power had failed, but they were few and slight, and she believed them over. Mr. Darnay had kissed her hand fervently and gratefully, and had turned to Mr. Striver, whom he warmly thanked. Mr. Striver, a man of little more than thirty, but looking twenty years older than he was, stout, loud, red, bluff, and free from any drawback of delicacy, had a pushing way of shouldering himself, morally and physically, into companies and conversations, that argued well for his shouldering his way up in life. He still had his wig and gown on, and he said, squaring himself at his late client to that degree that he squeezed the innocent Mr. Lorry clean out of the group, "'I am glad to have brought you off with honour, Mr. Darnay. It was an infamous prosecution, grossly infamous, but not the less likely to succeed on that account. "'You have laid me under an obligation to you for life, in two senses,' said his late client, taking his hand." I have done my best for you, Mr. Darnay, and my best is as good as another man's, I believe. It clearly being incumbent on someone to say, much better, Mr. Lorry said it, perhaps not quite disinterestedly, but with the interested object of squeezing himself back again. You think so? said Mr. Striver. Well, you have been present all day, and you ought to know. You are a man of business, too. And as such, quoth Mr. Lorry, whom the counsel learned in the law had now shouldered back into the group, just as he had previously shouldered him out of it, as such I will appeal to Dr. Manette to break up this conference and order us all to our homes. Miss Lucy looks ill, Mr. Darnay has had a terrible day, we are worn out. Speak for yourself, Mr. Lorry, said Striver, I have a night's work to do yet, speak for yourself. I speak for myself, answered Mr. Lorry, and for Mr. Darnay, and for Miss Lucy, and, Miss Lucy, do you not think I may speak for us all? He asked her the question pointedly, and with a glance at her father. His face had become frozen, as it were, in a very curious look at Darnay, an intent look, deepening into a frown of dislike and distrust, not even unmixed with fear. With this strange expression on him, his thoughts had wandered away. "'My father,' said Lucy, softly laying her hand on his, he slowly shook the shadow off and turned to her. "'Shall we go home, my father?' With a long breath he answered, "'Yes.' 
the friends of the acquitted prisoner had dispersed under the impression which he himself had originated that he would not be released that night the lights were nearly all extinguished in the passages the iron gates were being closed with a jar and a rattle and the dismal place was deserted until to-morrow morning's interest of gallows pillory whipping post and branding iron should repeople it Walking between her father and Mr. Darnay, Lucy Manette passed into the open air. A hackney coach was called, and the father and daughter departed in it. Mr. Stryver had left them in the passages to shoulder his way back to the robing room. Another person, who had not joined the group, or interchanged a word with any of them, but who had been leaning against the wall where its shadow was darkest, had silently strolled out after the rest, and had looked on until the coach drove away. He now stepped up to where Mr. Lorry and Mr. Darnay stood upon the pavement. "'So, Mr. Lorry, men of business may speak to Mr. Darnay now?' nobody had made any acknowledgment of mr carton's part in the day's proceedings nobody had known of it he was unrobed and was none the better for it in appearance if you knew what a conflict goes on in the business mind when the business mind is divided between good-natured impulse and business appearances you would be amused mr darnay mr lorry reddened and said warmly you have mentioned that before, sir. We men of business who serve a house are not our own masters. We have to think of the house more than ourselves. I know, I know, rejoined Mr. Carton carelessly. Don't be nettled, Mr. Lorry. You are as good as another. I have no doubt. Better, I dare say. And indeed, sir, pursued Mr. Lorry, not minding him, I really don't know what you have to do with the matter. If you'll excuse me, as very much your elder, for saying so, I really don't know that it is your business. Business, bless you, I have no business, said Mr. Carton. It is a pity you have not, sir. I think so, too. If you had, pursued Mr. Lorry, perhaps you would attend to it. Lord love you, no, I shouldn't, said Mr. Carton. "'Well, sir,' cried Mr. Lorry, thoroughly heated by his indifference, "'business is a very good thing, and a very respectable thing. "'And, sir, if business imposes its restraints and its silences and impediments, "'Mr. Darnay, as a young gentleman of generosity, "'knows how to make allowance for that circumstance. "'Mr. Darnay, good night. God bless you, sir. "'I hope you have been this day preserved for a prosperous and happy life. "'Chair there!' Perhaps a little angry with himself, as well as with the barrister, Mr. Lorry bustled into the chair, and was carried off to Telson's. Carton, who smelt of port wine, and did not appear to be quite sober, laughed then, and turned to Darnay. "'This is a strange chance that throws you and me together. This must be a strange night to you, standing alone here with your counterpart on these street stones.' "'I hardly seem yet,' returned Charles Darnay, "'to belong to this world again. "'I don't wonder at it. "'It's not so long since you were pretty far advanced "'on your way to another. "'You speak faintly. "'I begin to think I am faint. "'Then why the devil don't you dine? "'I dined myself while those numbskulls "'were deliberating which world you should belong to, "'this or some other. "'Let me show you the nearest tavern to dine well at.' Drawing his arm through his own, he took him down Ludgate Hill to Fleet Street, and so, up a covered way, into a tavern. Here they were shown into a little room, where Charles Darnay was soon recruiting his strength with a good plain dinner and good wine. While Carton sat opposite to him at the same table, with his separate bottle of port before him, and his fully half-insolent manner upon him. "'Do you feel yet that you belong to this terrestrial scheme again, Mr. Darnay? "'I am frightfully confused regarding time and place, "'but I am so far mended as to feel that. "'It must be an immense satisfaction.' "'He said it bitterly and filled up his glass again, which was a large one. "'As to me, the greatest desire I have is to forget that I belong to it. It has no good in it for me, except wine like this, nor I for it. So we are not much alike in that particular. Indeed, I begin to think we're not much alike in any particular, you and I. 
Confused by the emotion of the day, and feeling his being there with this double of coarse deportment to be like a dream, Charles Darnay was at a loss how to answer. Finally, answered not at all. "'Now your dinner is done,' Carton presently said. "'Why don't you call a health, Mr. Darnay? Why don't you give your toast?' "'What health? What toast?' "'Why, it's on the tip of your tongue. It ought to be. It must be. I swear it's there.' "'Miss Manette, then. Miss Manette, then.' Looking his companion full in the face while he drank the toast, Carton flung his glass over his shoulder against the wall, where it shivered to pieces, then rang the bell and ordered in another. "'That's a fair young lady to hand to a coach in the dark, Mr. Darnay,' he said, ruing his new goblet. A slight frown and a laconic, "'Yes,' were the answer. "'That's a fair young lady to be pitied by and wept for by. How does it feel? Is it worth being tried for one's life to be the object of such sympathy and compassion, Mr. Darnay?' Again Darnay answered not a word. "'She was mightily pleased to have your message when I gave it her. Not that she showed she was pleased, but I suppose she was.' The illusion served as a timely reminder to Darnay that this disagreeable companion had, of his own free will, assisted him in the strait of the day. He turned the dialogue to that point and thanked him for it. "'I neither want any thanks nor merit any,' was the careless rejoinder. "'It was nothing to do in the first place, and I don't know why I did it. In the second, "'Mr. Darnay, let me ask you a question.' "'Willingly.' and a small return for your good offices. Do you think I particularly like you? Really, Mr. Carton, returned the other, oddly disconcerted, I have not asked myself the question, but ask yourself the question now. You have acted as if you do, but I don't think you do. I don't think I do, said Carton. I begin to have a very good opinion of your understanding. Nevertheless, pursued Darnay, rising to ring the bell, there is nothing in that, I hope, to prevent my calling the reckoning, and our parting without ill blood on either side. Carton rejoining, nothing in life, Darnay rang. Do you call the whole reckoning, said Carton, on his answering in the affirmative. Then bring me another pint of this same wine drawer, and come and wake me at ten. The bill being paid, Charles Darnay rose, and wished him good night. Without returning the wish, Carton rose too, with something of a threat of defiance in his manner, and said, A last word, Mr. Darnay, you think I am drunk? I think you have been drinking, Mr. Carton. Think you know I have been drinking. Since I must say so, I know it. Then you shall likewise know why. I am a disappointed drudge, sir. I care for no man on earth, and no man on earth cares for me. Much to be regretted. You might have used your talents better. Maybe so, Mr. Darnay, maybe not. Don't let your sober face elate you, however. You don't know what it may come to. Good night. When he was left alone, the strange being took up a candle, went to a glass that hung against the wall, and surveyed himself minutely in it. "'Do you particularly like the man?' he muttered at his own image. "'Why should you particularly like a man who resembles you? There is nothing in you to like, you know that. Ah, confound you! What a change you have made in yourself! A good reason for taking to a man that he shows you what you have fallen away from, and what you might have been, changed places with him, and would you have been looked at by those blue eyes as he was, and commiserated by that agitated face as he was?' "'Come on, and have it out in plain words. You hate the fellow!' He resorted to his pint of wine for consolation, drank it all in a few minutes, and fell asleep on his arms, with his hair straggling over the table, and a long winding sheet in the candle dripping down upon him. End of Book 2, Chapter 4 Chapter 5. The Jackal 
Those were drinking days, and most men drank hard. So very great is the improvement time has brought about in such habits, that a moderate statement of the quantity of wine and punch which one man would swallow in the course of a night, without any detriment to his reputation as a perfect gentleman, would seem in these days a ridiculous exaggeration. The learned profession of the law was certainly not behind any other learned profession in its bacchanalian propensities. Neither was Mr. Stryver, already fast shouldering his way to a large and lucrative practice behind his compeers in this particular, any more than in the drier part of the legal race. A favourite at the Old Bailey, and eke at the Sessions, Mr. Stryver had begun cautiously to hew away the lower staves of the ladder on which he mounted. Sessions and Old Bailey had now to summon their favourite, specially, to their longing arms, and shouldering itself towards the visage of the Lord Chief Justice in the Court of King's Bench, the florid countenance of Mr. Stryver might be daily seen, bursting out of the bed of wigs like a great sunflower pushing its way at the sun from among a rank garden full of flaring companions. It had once been noted at the bar that while Mr. Stryver was a glib man, and an unscrupulous, and a ready, and a bold, he had not that faculty of extracting the essence from a heap of statements which is among the most striking and necessary of the advocate's accomplishments. But a remarkable improvement came upon him as to this. The more business he got, the greater his power seemed to grow of getting at its pith and marrow, and however late at night he sat carousing with Sidney Carton, he always had his points at his fingers' ends in the morning. Sidney Carton, idlest and most unpromising of men, was Stryver's great ally. What the two drank together, between Hilary Term and Michaelmas, might have floated a king's ship. Stryver never had a case in hand anywhere, but Carton was there, with his hands in his pockets, staring at the ceiling of the court. They went the same circuit, and even there they prolonged their usual orgies late into the night, and Carton was rumoured to be seen at broad day going home stealthily and unsteadily to his lodgings like a dissipated cat. At last it began to get about, among such as were interested in the matter, that although Sidney Carton would never be a lion, he was an amazingly good jackal, and that he rendered suit and service to Stryver in that humble capacity. Ten o'clock, sir,' said the man at the tavern, whom he had charged to wake him. Ten o'clock, sir.' "'What's the matter?' Ten o'clock, sir.' "'What do you mean? Ten, ten o'clock at night?' "'Yes, sir, your honour told me to call you.' "'Oh, I remember. Very well, very well.' After a few dull efforts to get to sleep again, which the man dexterously combated by stirring the fire continuously for five minutes, he got up, tossed his hat on, and walked out. He turned into the temple, and, having revived himself by twice pacing the pavements of King's Bench Walk and paper buildings, turned into the Stryver chambers. The Stryver clerk, who never assisted at these conferences, had gone home, and the Stryver principal opened the door. He had his slippers on and a loose bedgown, and his throat was bare for his greater ease. He had that rather wild, strained, seared marking about the eyes, which may be observed in all free livers of his class, from the portrait of Jeffreys downwards, and which can be traced, under various disguises of art, through the portraits of every drinking age. "'You're a little late, memory,' said Stryver. About the usual time, it may be a quarter of an hour later. They went into a dingy room lined with books and littered with papers, where there was a blazing fire. A kettle steamed upon the hob, and in the midst of the wreck of papers a table shone, with plenty of wine upon it, and brandy, and rum, and sugar, and lemons. "'You have had your bottle, I perceive, Sidney.' Two to-night, I think, I've been dining with the day's client, or seeing him dine, it's all one. That was a rare point, Sidney, that you brought to bear upon the identification. How did you come by it? When did it strike you? 
I thought he was rather a handsome fellow, and I thought I should have been much the same sort of fellow if I had had any luck. Mr. Stryver laughed till he shook his precocious paunch. You and your luck, Sidney, get to work, get to work. Sullenly enough, the jackal loosened his dress, went into an adjoining room, and came back with a large jug of cold water, a basin, and a towel or two. Steeping the towels in the water, and partially wringing them out, he folded them on his head in a manner hideous to behold, sat down at the table, and said, "'Now I am ready.' "'Not much boiling down to be done to-night, memory,' said Mr. Stryver, gaily, as he looked among his papers. "'How much?' "'Only two sets of them. Give me the worst first. There they are, Sidney. Fire away.' The lion then composed himself on his back on a sofa on one side of the drinking-table, while the jackal sat at his own paper-bestrewn table proper on the other side of it, with the bottles and glasses ready to his hand. Both resorted to the drinking-table without stint, but each in a different way, the lion for the most part reclining with his hands in his waistband, looking at the fire, or occasionally flirting with some lighter document. The jackal, with knitted brows and intent face, so deep in his task that his eyes did not even follow the hand he stretched out for his glass, which often groped about for a minute or more before it found the glass for his lips. Two or three times the matter in hand became so knotty that the jackal found it imperative on him to get up and steep his towels anew. From these pilgrimages to the jug and basin, he returned with such eccentricities of damp headgear as no words can describe, which were made the more ludicrous by his anxious gravity. At length the jackal had got together a compact repast for the lion, and proceeded to offer it to him. The lion took it with care and caution, made his selections from it, and his remarks upon it, and the jackal assisted both. When the repast was fully discussed, the lion put his hands in his waistband again, and lay down to meditate. The jackal then invigorated himself with a bum for his throttle, and a fresh application to his head, and applied himself to the collection of a second meal. This was administered to the lion in the same manner, and was not disposed of until the clock struck three in the morning. "'And now we have done, Sidney. Fill a bumper of punch,' said Mr. Stryver. The jackal removed the towels from his head, which had been steaming again, shook himself, yawned, shivered, and complied. "'You were very sound, Sidney, in the matter of those crown witnesses to-day, every question told. I always am sound, am I not? I don't gainsay it. What has roughened your temper? Put some punch to it and smooth it again.' With a deprecatory grunt, the jackal again complied. "'The old Sidney Carton of old Shrewsbury School,' said Stryver, nodding his head over him as he reviewed him in the present and the past, "'the old seesaw Sidney, up one minute and down the next, now in spirits and now in despondency.' "'Ah!' returned the other, sighing, "'yes, the same Sidney with the same luck.' Even then I did exercises for other boys, and seldom did my own. And why not? God knows. It was my way, I suppose. He sat with his hands in his pockets, and his legs stretched out before him, looking at the fire. Carton, said his friend, squaring himself at him with a bullying air, as if the fire-grate had been the furnace in which sustained endeavour was forged, and the one delicate thing to be done for the old Sidney Carton of old Shrewsbury School was to shoulder him into it. Your way is, and always was, a lame way. You summon no energy and purpose. Look at me." "'Oh, botheration!' returned Sidney, with a lighter and more good-humoured laugh. "'Don't you be moral!' "'How have I done what I have done?' said Stryver. "'How do I do what I do?' "'Partly through paying me to help you, I suppose. "'But it's not worth your while to apostrophise me or the air about it. "'What you want to do, you do. "'You were always in the front rank, and I was always behind.' I had to get into the front rank. I was not born there, was I? 
I was not present at the ceremony, but my opinion is you were, said Carton. At this he laughed again, and they both laughed. Before Shrewsbury, and at Shrewsbury, and ever since Shrewsbury, pursued Carton, you have fallen into your rank, and I have fallen into mine. Even when we were fellow students in the student quarter of Paris, picking up French, and French law, and other French crumbs that we didn't get much good of, you were always somewhere, and I was always nowhere. And whose fault was that? Upon my soul, I'm not sure that it was not yours. You were always driving and riving and shouldering and passing, to that restless degree that I had no chance for my life but in rust and repose. It's a gloomy thing, however, to talk about one's own past with the day breaking. Turn me in some other direction before I go. Well, then, pledge me to the pretty witness, said Stryver, holding up his glass. Are you turned in a pleasant direction? Apparently not, for he became gloomy again. Pretty witness, he muttered, looking down into his glass. I've had enough of witnesses today and tonight. Who's your pretty witness? The picturesque doctor's daughter, Miss Manette. She pretty? Is she not? No. Why, man alive, she was the admiration of the whole court. Rot the admiration of the whole court. Who made the old Bailey a judge of beauty? She was a golden-haired doll. Do you know, Sidney, said Mr. Stryver, looking at him with sharp eyes, and slowly drawing a hand across his florid face, do you know, I rather thought at the time that you sympathized with the golden-haired doll, and were quick to see what happened to the golden-haired doll? Quick to see what happened? If a girl, doll or no doll, swoons within a yard or two of a man's nose, he can see it without a perspective glass. I pledge you, but I deny the beauty. And now I'll have no more drink. I'll get to bed. When his host followed him out on the staircase with a candle to light him down the stairs, the day was coldly looking in through its grimy windows. When he got out of the house, the air was cold and sad, the dull sky overcast, the river dark and dim, the whole scene like a lifeless desert. And wreaths of dust were spinning round and round before the morning blast, as if the desert sand had risen far away, and the first spray of it in its advance had begun to overwhelm the city. Waste forces within him and a desert all around, this man stood still on his way across a silent terrace, and saw for a moment, lying in the wilderness before him, a mirage of honourable ambition, self-denial, and perseverance. In the fair city of this vision there were airy galleries from which the loves and graces looked upon him, gardens in which the fruits of life hung ripening, waters of hope that sparkled in his sight. A moment, and it was gone. Climbing to a high chamber in a well of houses, he threw himself down in his clothes on a neglected bed, and its pillow was wet with wasted tears. Sadly, sadly the sun rose. It rose upon no sadder sight than the man of good abilities and good emotions, incapable of their directed exercise, incapable of his own help and his own happiness, sensible of the blight on him, and resigning himself to let it eat him away. End of Book 2, Chapter 5 Chapter 6. Hundreds of People The quiet lodgings of Dr. Manette were in a quiet street corner not far from Soho Square. On the afternoon of a certain fine Sunday, when the waves of four months had rolled over the trial for treason, and carried it, as to the public interest and memory, far out to sea, Mr. Jarvis Lorry walked along the sunny streets from Clerkenwell, where he lived, on his way to dine with the doctor. After several relapses into business absorption, Mr. Lorry had become the doctor's friend, and the quiet street corner was the sunny part of his life. On this certain fine Sunday, Mr. Lorry walked towards Soho, 
early in the afternoon for three reasons of habit. Firstly, because on fine Sundays he often walked out before dinner with the doctor and Lucy. Secondly, because on unfavorable Sundays he was accustomed to be with them as the family friend, talking, reading, looking out of window, and generally getting through the day. Thirdly, because he happened to have his own little shrewd doubts to solve, and knew how the ways of the doctor's household pointed to that time as a likely time for solving them. A quainter corner than the corner where the doctor lived was not to be found in London. There was no way through it, and the front windows of the doctor's lodgings commanded a pleasant little vista of street that had a congenial air of retirement on it. There were few buildings then, north of the Oxford Road, and forest trees flourished, and wild flowers grew, and the hawthorn blossomed in the now-vanished fields. As a consequence, country airs circulated in Soho with vigorous freedom, instead of languishing into the parish like stray paupers without a settlement, and there was many a good south wall not far off on which the peaches ripened in their season. The summer light struck into the corner brilliantly in the early part of the day, but when the streets grew hot the corner was in shadow, though not in shadow so remote but that you could see beyond it into a glare of brightness. It was a cool spot, staid but cheerful, a wonderful place for echoes, and a very harbour from the raging streets. There ought to have been a tranquil bark in such an anchorage, and there was. The doctor occupied two floors of a large, stiff house, where several callings purported to be pursued by day, but whereof little was audible any day, and which was shunned by all of them at night. In a building at the back, attainable by a courtyard, where a plane tree rustled its green leaves, church organs claimed to be made, and silver to be chased, and likewise gold to be beaten by some mysterious giant who had a golden arm starting out of the wall of the front hall, as if he had beaten himself precious, and menaced a similar conversion of all visitors. A very little of these trades, or of a lonely lodger rumoured to live upstairs, or of a dim coach-trimming maker asserted to have a counting-house below, was ever heard or seen. Occasionally a stray workman putting his coat on traversed the hall, or a stranger peered about there, or a distant clink was heard across the courtyard, or a thump from the golden giant. These, however, were only the exceptions required to prove the rule that the sparrows in the plane tree behind the house and the echoes in the corner before it had their own way from Sunday morning unto Saturday night. Dr. Manette received such patience here as his old reputation and its revival in the floating whispers of his story brought him. His scientific knowledge and his vigilance and skill in conducting ingenious experiments brought him otherwise into moderate request, and he earned as much as he wanted. These things were within Mr. Jarvis Lorry's knowledge, thoughts, and notice when he rang the doorbell of the tranquil house in the corner on the fine Sunday afternoon. Dr. Manette at home? Expected home. Miss Lucy at home? expected home, Miss Pross at home, possibly at home, but of a certainty impossible for handmaid to anticipate intentions of Miss Pross as to admission or denial of the fact. As I am at home myself, said Miss Lorry, I'll go upstairs. Although the doctor's daughter had known nothing of the country of her birth, she appeared to have innately derived from it that ability to make much of little means, which is one of its most useful and most agreeable characteristics. Simple as the furniture was, it was set off by so many little adornments, of no value but for their taste and fancy, that its effect was delightful. The disposition of everything in the rooms, from the largest object to the least, the arrangement of colours, the elegant variety and contrast obtained by thrift in trifles, by delicate hands, clear eyes, and good sense, 
were at once so pleasant in themselves and so expressive of their originator that as mr lorry stood looking about him the very chairs and tables seemed to ask him with something of that peculiar expression which he knew so well by this time whether he approved there were three rooms on a floor and the doors by which they communicated being put open that the air might pass freely through them all mr lorry smilingly observant of that fanciful resemblance which he detected all around him walked from one to another the first was the best room and in it were lucy's birds and flowers and books and desk and work-table and box of water-colours the second was the doctor's consulting-room used also as the dining-room the third changingly speckled by the rustle of the plane-tree in the yard was the doctor's bedroom and there in a corner stood the disused shoemaker's bench and tray of tools much as it had stood on the fifth floor of the dismal house by the wine-shop in the suburb of st antoine in paris i wonder said mr lorry pausing in his looking about that he keeps that reminder of his sufferings about him and why wonder at that was the abrupt inquiry that made him start it proceeded from miss pross the wild red woman strong of hand whose acquaintance he had first made at the royal george hotel at dover and had since improved i should have thought mr lorry began pooh you would have thought said miss pross mr lorry left off how do you do inquired that lady then sharply and yet as if to express that she bore him no malice i am pretty well i thank you answered mr lorry with meekness how are you nothing to boast of said miss pross indeed ah indeed said miss pross i am very much put out about my ladybird indeed for gracious sake say something else besides indeed or you'll fidget me to death said miss pross whose character dissociated from stature was shortness really then said mr lorry as an amendment really it's bad enough returned miss pross but better yes i'm very much put out may i ask the cause i don't want dozens of people who are not at all worthy of ladybird to come here looking after her said miss pross do dozens come here for that purpose hundreds said miss pross it was characteristic of this lady as of some other people before her time and since that whenever her original proposition was questioned she exaggerated it dear me said mr lorry as the safest remark he could think of I have lived with the darling, or the darling has lived with me, and paid me for it, which she certainly should never have done. You may take your affidavit, if I could have afforded to keep either myself or her for nothing, since she was ten years old, and it's really very hard, said Miss Pross. Not seeing with precision what was very hard, Mr. Lorry shook his head using that important part of himself as a sort of fairy cloak that would fit anything all sorts of people who are not in the least degree worthy of the pet are always turning up said miss pross when you began it i began it miss pross didn't you who brought her father to life oh if that was the beginning of it said mr lorry it wasn't ending it i suppose i say when you begin it it was hard enough not that i have any fault to find with dr manette except that he is not worthy of such a daughter which is no imputation on him for it was not to be expected that anybody should be under any circumstances but it really is doubly and trebly hard to have crowds and multitudes of people turning up after him i could have forgiven him to take lady bird's affections away from me mr lorry knew miss pross to be very jealous but he also knew her by this time to be beneath the service of her eccentricity one of those unselfish creatures found only among women who will for pure love and admiration bind themselves willing slaves to youth when they have lost it to beauty that they never had to accomplishments that they were never fortunate enough to gain to bright hopes that never shone upon their own sombre lives
He knew enough of the world to know that there is nothing in it better than the faithful service of the heart, so rendered and so free from any mercenary taint. He had such an exalted respect for it, that in the retributive arrangements made by his own mind, we all make such arrangements, more or less, he stationed Miss Pross much nearer to the lower angels than many ladies immeasurably better got up, both by nature and art, who had balances at Tellson's. "'There never was, nor will be, but one man worthy of Ladybird,' said Miss Pross, "'and that was my brother Solomon, if he hadn't made a mistake in life.' Here again Mr. Lorry's inquiries into Miss Pross's personal history had established the fact that her brother Solomon was a heartless scoundrel who had stripped her of everything she possessed as a stake to speculate with and had abandoned her in her poverty for evermore with no touch of compunction miss pross's fidelity of belief in solomon deducting a mere trifle for this slight mistake was quite a serious matter with mr lorry and had its weight in his good opinion of her as we happen to be alone for the moment and are both people of business he said when they had got back to the drawing-room and had sat down there in friendly relations let me ask you does the doctor in talking with lucy never refer to the shoemaking time yet never and yet keeps that bench and those tools beside him ah returned miss pross shaking her head but i don't say he don't refer to it within himself "'Do you believe that he thinks of it much?' "'I do,' said Miss Pross. "'Do you imagine,' Mr. Lorry had begun, when Miss Pross took him up short, with, "'Never imagine anything. Have no imagination at all. I stand corrected. Do you suppose, you go so far as to suppose sometimes?' "'Now and then,' said Miss Pross. "'Do you suppose,' Mr. Lorry went on, with a laughing twinkle in his bright eye, as it looked kindly at her, "'that Dr. Manette has any theory of his own, preserved through all those years, relative to the cause of his being so oppressed, perhaps even to the name of his oppressor?' "'I don't suppose anything about it but what Lady Bird tells me, and that is, that she thinks he has.' now don't be angry at my asking all these questions because i am a mere dull man of business and you are a woman of business dull miss pross inquired with placidity rather wishing his modest adjective away mr lorry replied no 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 surely not to return to business is it not remarkable that dr manette unquestionably innocent of any crime as we are all well assured he is should never touch upon that question i will not say with me though he had business relations with me many years ago and we are now intimate i will say with the fair daughter to whom he is so devotedly attached and who is so devotedly attached to him believe me miss pross i don't approach the topic with you out of curiosity but out of zealous interest well to the best of my understanding and bad's the best you'll tell me said miss pross softened by the tone of the apology he is afraid of the whole subject afraid it's plain enough i should think why he may be it's a dreadful remembrance besides that his loss of himself grew out of it not knowing how he lost himself or how he recovered himself he may never feel certain of not losing himself again that alone wouldn't make the subject pleasant i should think it was a profounder remark than mr lorry had looked for true said he and fearful to reflect upon yet a doubt lurks in my mind miss pross whether it is good for dr manette to have that suppression always shut up within him indeed it is this doubt and the uneasiness it sometimes causes me that has led me to our present confidence can't be helped said miss pross shaking her head touch that string and he instantly changes for the worse better leave it alone in short must leave it alone like or no like sometimes he gets up in the dead of the night and will be heard by us overhead here 
walking up and down walking up and down in his room lady bird has learnt to know then that his mind is walking up and down walking up and down in his old prison she hurries to him and they go on together walking up and down walking up and down until he is composed but he never says a word of the true reason of his restlessness to her and she finds it best not to hint at it to him in silence they go walking up and down together walking up and down together till her love and company have brought him to himself notwithstanding miss pross's denial of her own imagination there was a perception of the pain of being monotonously haunted by one sad idea in her repetition of the phrase walking up and down which testified to her possessing such a thing the corner has been mentioned as a wonderful corner for echoes it had begun to echo so resoundingly to the tread of coming feet that it seemed as though the very mention of that weary pacing to and fro had set it going here they are said miss pross rising to break up the conference and now we shall have hundreds of people pretty soon it was such a curious corner in its acoustical properties such a peculiar ear of a place that as mr lorry stood at the open window looking for the father and daughter whose steps he heard he fancied they would never approach not only would the echoes die away as though the steps had gone but echoes of other steps that never came would be heard in their stead and would die away for good when they seemed close at hand However, father and daughter did at last appear, and Miss Pross was ready at the street door to receive them. Miss Pross was a pleasant sight, albeit wild and red and grim, taking off her darling's bonnet when she came upstairs, and touching it up with the ends of her handkerchief, and blowing the dust off it, and folding her mantle ready for laying by, and smoothing her rich hair with as much pride as she could possibly have taken in her own hair, if she had been the vainest and handsomest of women her darling was a pleasant sight too embracing her and thanking her and protesting against her taking so much trouble for her which last she only dared to do playfully or miss pross sorely hurt would have retired to her own chamber and cried the doctor was a pleasant sight too looking on at them and telling miss prost how she spoilt lucy in accents and with eyes that had as much spoiling in them as miss pross had and would have had more if it were possible mr lorry was a pleasant sight too beaming at all this in his little wig and thanking his bachelor stars for having lighted him in his declining years to a home but no hundreds of people came to see the sights and mr lorry looked in vain for the fulfilment of miss pross's prediction dinner time and still no hundreds of people in the arrangements of the little household miss pross took charge of the lower regions and always acquitted herself marvellously her dinners of a very modest quality were so well cooked and so well served and so neat in their contrivances half english and half french that nothing could be better miss pross's friendship being of the thoroughly practical kind she had ravaged soho and the adjacent provinces in search of impoverished french who tempted by shillings and half-crowns would impart culinary mysteries to her from these decayed sons and daughters of Gaul she had acquired such wonderful arts that the woman and girl who formed the staff of domestics regarded her as quite a sorceress or Cinderella's godmother who would send out for a fowl, a rabbit, a vegetable or two from the garden and change them into anything she pleased. On Sundays Miss Pross dined at the doctor's table, but on other days persisted in taking her meals at unknown periods, either in the lower regions or in her own room on the second floor, a blue chamber to which no one but her ladybird ever gained admittance. On this occasion Miss Pross, responding to Ladybird's pleasant face and pleasant efforts to please her, unbent exceedingly, so the dinner was very pleasant too it was an oppressive day and after dinner lucy proposed that the wine should be carried out under the plane tree and they should sit there in the air 
As everything turned upon her and revolved about her, they went out under the plane tree, and she carried the wine down for the special benefit of Mr. Lorry. She had installed herself some time before as Mr. Lorry's cup-bearer, and while they sat under the plane tree talking, she kept his glass replenished. Mysterious backs and ends of houses peeped at them as they talked, and the plane tree whispered to them in its own way above their heads. Still, the hundreds of people did not present themselves. Mr. Darnay presented himself while they were sitting under the plane tree, but he was only one. Dr. Manette received him kindly, and so did Lucy. But Miss Pross suddenly became affected with a twitching in the head and body, and retired into the house. She was not unfrequently the victim of this disorder, and she called it, in familiar conversation, a fit of the jerks. The doctor was in his best condition, and looked specially young. The resemblance between him and Lucy was very strong at such times, and as they sat side by side, she leaning on his shoulder, and he resting his arm on the back of her chair, it was very agreeable to trace the likeness. He had been talking all day on many subjects, and with unusual vivacity. "'Pray, Dr. Manette,' said Mr. Darnay, as they sat under the plane tree, and he said it in the natural pursuit of the topic in hand, which happened to be the old buildings of London, "'have you seen much of the tower?' "'Lucy and I have been there, but only casually. We have seen enough of it to know that it teems with interest, little more.' "'I have been there, as you remember,' said Darnay, with a smile, though reddening a little angrily, "'in another character, and not in a character that gives facilities for seeing much of it. "'They told me a curious thing when I was there.' "'What was that?' Lucy asked. "'In making some alterations, the workmen came upon an old dungeon, "'which had been for many years built up and forgotten. "'Every stone of its inner wall was covered by inscriptions, "'which had been carved by prisoners, dates, names, complaints, and prayers. "'Upon a cornerstone in an angle of the wall, "'one prisoner, who seemed to have gone to execution, "'had cut as his last work three letters.' They were done with some very poor instrument, and hurriedly with an unsteady hand. At first they were read as D-I-C, but, on being more carefully examined, the last letter was found to be G. There was no record or legend of any prisoner with those initials, and many fruitless guesses were made what the name could have been. At length it was suggested that the letters were not initials, but the complete word DIG. The floor was examined very carefully under the inscription, and in the earth beneath a stone, or tile, or some fragment of paving, were found the ashes of a paper, mingled with the ashes of a small leathern case or bag. What the unknown prisoner had written will never be read, but he had written something, and hidden it away to keep it from the jailer. "'My father!' exclaimed Yusi. "'You are ill!' He had suddenly started up with his hand to his head. His manner and his look quite terrified them all. "'No, my dear, not, not ill. There are large drops of rain falling, and they made me start. We had better go in.' He recovered himself almost instantly. Rain was really falling in large drops, and he showed the back of his hand with raindrops on it. But he said not a single word in reference to the discovery that had been told of, and, as they went into the house, the business eye of Mr. Lorry either detected, or fancied it detected, on his face, as it turned toward Charles Darnay, the same singular look that had been upon it when it turned towards him in the passages of the courthouse. He recovered himself so quickly, however, that Mr. Lorry had doubts of his business eye. The arm of the golden giant in the hall was not more steady than he was, when he stopped under it to remark to them that he was not yet proof against slight surprises, if he ever would be, and that the rain had startled him. Tea-time, and Miss Pross making tea, with another fit of the jerks upon her, and yet no hundreds of people. Mr. Carton had lounged in, but he made only two. 
the night was so very sultry that although they sat with doors and windows open they were overpowered by heat when the tea-table was done with they all moved to one of the windows and looked out into the heavy twilight lucy sat by her father darnay sat beside her carton leaned against a window the curtains were long and white and some of the thunder gusts that whirled into the corner caught them up to the ceiling and waved them like spectral wings the raindrops are still falling large heavy and few said dr manette it comes slowly it comes surely said carton they spoke low as people watching and waiting mostly do as people in a dark room watching and waiting for lightning always do there was a great hurry in the streets of people speeding away to get shelter before the storm broke the wonderful corner for echoes resounded with the echoes of footsteps coming and going yet not a footstep was there a multitude of people and yet a solitude said darnay when they had listened for a while is it not impressive mr darnay asked lucy sometimes i have sat here of an evening until i have fancied but even the shade of a foolish fancy makes me shudder to-night when all is so black and solemn let us shudder too we may know what it is it will seem nothing to you such whims are only impressive as we originate them i think they are not to be communicated i have sometimes sat alone here of an evening listening until i have made the echoes out to be the echoes of all the footsteps that are coming by and by into our lives there is a great crowd coming one day into our lives if that be so sidney carton struck in in his moody way the footsteps were incessant and the hurry of them became more and more rapid the corner echoed and re-echoed with the tread of feet some as it seemed under the windows some as it seemed in the room some coming some going some breaking off some stopping altogether all in the distant streets and not one within sight are all these footsteps destined to come to all of us miss manette or are we to divide them among us i don't know mr darnay i told you it was a foolish fancy but you asked for it when i have yielded myself to it i have been alone and then i have imagined them the footsteps of the people who are to come into my life and my father's i take them into mine said carton i ask no questions and make no stipulations there is a great crowd bearing down upon us miss manette and i see them by the lightning he added the last words after there had been a vivid flash which had shown him lounging in the window. "'And I hear them,' he added again, after a peal of thunder. "'Here they come, fast, fierce, and furious!' It was the rush and roar of rain that he typified and it stopped him for no voice could be heard in it a memorable storm of thunder and lightning broke with that sweep of water and there was not a moment's interval in crash and fire and rain until the moon rose at midnight the great bell of st paul's was striking one in the cleared air when mr lorry escorted by jerry high-booted and bearing a lantern set forth on his return passage to clerkenwell there were solitary patches of road on the way between soho and clerkenwell and mr lorry mindful of footpads always retained jerry for this service though it was usually performed a good two hours earlier what a night it has been almost a night jerry said mr lorry to bring the dead out of their graves i never see the night myself master nor yet i don't expect to what would do that answered jerry good night mr carton said the man of business good night mr darnay shall we ever see such a night again together perhaps perhaps see the great crowd of people with its rush and roar bearing down upon them too end of book two chapter six